there are many instances where colonization and infections really do warrant antifungals and we want to make sure that those stay available. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Tessier of Life After Mold, and today I'm going to be chatting about when to use antifungals in mold illness. Join me. Before we start, I just want to remind everybody that this is not medical advice, and nothing that I cover in today's video is meant as diagnosis, treatment, or management of any health issue or condition, and it does not replace any opinion and or care provided by your local medical provider or medical authority. And of course, this is for strictly educational purposes only. So with that aside, let's get into it. So to start, I want to talk about a classification of mold illness. This is going to be really helpful for you guys to wrap your head around before we get into when to use antifungals, because we really want to use antifungals when we think there are fungi in the body that are out of control. Now, granted, we have tons of fungi that are always existing in our body, but even science isn't quite clear as to when the fungi that exist in our body start to kind of feel a little bit full of themselves and start running amok, you know? That jury's still out, but there are times in which the fungi that exist in our body really start to need to come under control. And that can happen with antifungals. Now, this can happen in advance of a deep-seated invasive fungal infection. You know, sometimes it's a, a colonization that really needs some support and control. And so that's what I want to dialogue about here now. The four major ways that I really think about how mold can interact with the body is through allergy, which is widely accepted by the major medical model. We know that mold can cause asthma and rashes and coughing and allergic like symptoms. That's, you know, anyone can agree with that for sure. So allergies is one way. And then we have this whole concept of infection or colonization, which I've mentioned. And then this other concept of uh, toxic reaction or mycotoxicosis, myco, M-Y-C-O, as in fungus, so fungi, toxin. And then finally, we have this chronic inflammation, environmentally acquired illness, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, CIRS, biotoxin illness, goes by lots of different names here. And so when I'm sitting with someone, in order to really wrap my head around what their picture looks like, and then what testing to do, and potentially what treatment to go after. I find that categorizing these four different types of mold illness are really important. Now, the reason why I want to call these out is obviously we've, we've spoken about how this is going to be a video on antifungals, and I want to call out the idea of the infection or colonization here. So what becomes confusing about all of these is that they're all overlapping in a way. You know, you can have overlapping symptoms from one to the other. So like, for instance, someone who has environmental allergies, where the allergies are out floating around in their environment, when they breathe them in, they have an allergic reaction. Well, they could also have a toxic reaction. Okay. So right there, we have two circles, two like quadrants of these mold-related illnesses that are overlapping and it kind of muddies the water. Similarly, we have our colonization infection, which means that the molds are inside the body rather than outside. But with that colonization infection, we can still have allergic-like reactions and we can still have that toxic reaction to the fungi growing in the system and just being their perfect selves, doing what they do best. So this is where it becomes important to really differentiate what is happening by making sure that someone has addressed their environmental mold exposure. So there's two forms of mold exposure and our body is the dividing line. We have our external out here and we have our internal, what's inside, physically inside the, the hollow chamber of our body. If we go and we ensure that someone's environment is clear for mold and it's they've been remediated or they've moved to a safe space or, you know, there's lots of ways around this. I won't get into this in this video. There's plenty of other videos on my channel that you can take a peek at about that. But when we work to secure and clear the environment, which is necessary before any one of the treatments for the four different ways mold interacts with the body, then we really know that if there are continued issues, then the problems aren't coming from the environment. They're potentially coming from inside the body, which could theoretically mean that there is a fungal colonization or infection causing an allergen-like reaction, causing 
a toxic-like reaction causing a chronic inflammation-like reaction. So this is why it's so incredibly important to address the external environment before really considering doing any of the internal work for folks. So then a lot of people get caught up and they say, well, why can't I just take an antifungal even while I'm still in exposure? I mean, the first thing, aside from that whole figuring out what's what, <laughs> is that folks, I mean, realistically, you can have some nasty treatment reactions by undergoing treatment before getting out of exposure. So first and foremost, there's that. Additionally, what we see, if we were to give you an antifungal while you were still in exposure, then we are potentially wasting your time and your money. The reason why is you can become recolonized by what's in the environment. You know, you finish taking your round of antifungals, you've well tolerated, this is good, this is great. But what are you doing in that environment? You're breathing in mold around the clock. And that mold is going to get stuck in your biofilms and perpetuate and your antifungal treatment is going to be rendered useless. So it's going to be a waste of time and money. The other thing that's going to happen here is potentially you take the antifungal, you don't get better after still being exposed and you stop and you go, see, I knew it wasn't mold. The antifungal didn't work. And meanwhile, it could still very much be mold. And it might not be something that you realize until five and 10 years later, when you double back and you're like, you know, like I did take the antifungals, like while I was still exposed, maybe I should look back into that. Like the reason why I get so nitty gritty on this stuff is I just want to save people time and money. This whole process is stressful and overwhelming, you know, in a step-by-step -step really well thought out way to approach these cases is the way to go because it's just going to waste so much time and money. And it just, it just, frustrates me so much when I hear doctors tell patients that you can absolutely stay in mold forever and, and get better. And yes, I have videos where I talk about going into a more histamine environment rather than the current toxic environment that made you sick. And yes, when you're working with someone, sometimes you have to split hairs. Sometimes there isn't perfection and you're looking for different and or better, preferably and or better. It's just, it drives me crazy when people tell clients to their face that they can stay in the same home that made them sick without addressing any of the mold concerns and undergo treatment. Like it's, anyway, off my high horse on that one, guys. The other, the reason so far why you shouldn't take antifungals well exposed is because of the colonization issue, the recolonization, wasting time, wasting money, potentially getting worse. And then, you know, thinking that mold was never an issue, even though it was because treatment failed because you were still exposed. You know, I would say the final and biggest concern is developing antifungal resistance. Now, I'm sure you've heard of antibiotic resistance as the same reason why, you know, we don't give people antibiotics for the flu. It's the same reason now why we typically don't give children antibiotics for ear infections. With antifungals, we have even far less antibiotics, um, antifungals than we do antibiotics. There are far less in number. There's not as many in the pipeline. They take a long time to develop. Fungi are really smart developing uh, resistance mechanisms. We don't have enough bullets to fight that war, guys. And so the biggest concern about all of this for your sake and the greater community's sake is developing antifungal resistance. And if you develop antifungal resistance, no treatment is going to work. And then you'll be stuck like this forever. Okay. Like that's, that's the easiest way I can say it. And so, you know, there is a problem with antifungal resistance. So that way, if you need to have it, you need to make sure that you are not exposed because otherwise, you know, you're, you're almost guaranteeing antifungal resistance. So these are the reasons why we have people go through uh, a very algorithmic process before they use antifungals. It's for their time, their money, not having to double back years from now, and then keeping themselves in their community protected. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to hear for some, and the reality is there are many instances where 
colonization and infections really do warrant antifungals. And we want to make sure that those stay available and helpful for those folks. So realistically, proper use is absolutely necessary. And so in closing, the biggest key to being able to successfully and ethically use antifungals in mold illness is to make sure that you are addressing your external exposure first. So if all of this information was helpful, please stay tuned for added videos. I'm adding more and more as we speak. And please be sure to like and subscribe and check out my other videos. And of course, I'm so glad you're here and I am so excited to help you find your life after mold.